Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Celtic Junction Arts Center's ongoing social justice series of seminars. My name is Natalie Nugent O'Shea. I'm the executive director of Celtic Junction Arts Center. To Foltrov Go, Celtic Junction Arts Center is Misha Stuhar of the Irish Cultural Center here at uh, Celtic Junction. We try to weave together traditions of art and language, dance and music, and we are coming to you live uh, in the seminar from the Celtic Junction's new recording room. Uh, we were gifted with a generous donation to update our classroom and our library processing center and to add a beautiful new recording room, uh, which you can kind of see behind me. We've got a lot of that uh, special equipment. So this is where we have started to uh, try out our seminars. Now our seminars are supported in part by Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs. It's that immigrant support program, which is uh, a big part of how we come to be with you today. As we get started, one of the things we always want to recognize is that the Celtic Junction Arts Center is situated on Dakota and Anishinaabe land. And we're very, very honored uh, to have had some of those indigenous peoples be a part of our previous social justice seminars. We want to say thank you so much for being here. Um, now we actually get to the fun of it. Tonight, we are going to have a seminar on women in Irish street art. Now, this is different to others that we've had, not only and that we have not tackled this topic, uh, but that we also have never had a panel of all women. And a big part of what we try to do is to amplify um, different voices. So I'm really excited about this conversation that we're going to have tonight. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Molly McIntosh. Uh, Molly, if you want to go ahead and start your video. Uh, Molly is the executive director of the Edina Historical Society, and she is going to bring us on a fantastic journey um, through different parts of Ireland, mostly the North, I believe. And Molly, where it's wonderful to have you here tonight. Yes, thank you so much, Natalie. I'm very excited to finally be able to partner with the Celtic Junctions Art Center on a lot of the research that I've been doing throughout the past, I want to say, five years now. Okay. Well, I am looking forward to this, so I'm going to remove myself a little bit and let you take it away. Thank you, Molly. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to get my screen shared here. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so like Natalie said, my name is Molly McIntosh, and I have a BA in history and a master's in art history and museum studies. And studying the Renaissance just was not good enough for me, and my interest really lied with street art and how we see our per ourselves portrayed in the streets and how we connect with art in a very public fashion. And one of the first things that really draw me to, to street art was Ireland. I had begged my dad to bring me there after I got a bachelor's in history and he finally agreed after pulling some legs. And Spending some time there, you find that there is art around every single corner, especially when it comes to the streets, every single alleyway, and many, many of the gable houses that you see throughout the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland are decorated head to toe in these very beautiful works. And so the study of street art, murals, and graffiti has increasingly become an area of interest in modern art history, as artists have taken to the streets for public expression and political dissent. And we have an excellent example of this here in the Twin Cities. In Minneapolis and St. Paul, we've seen an unprecedented wave of street art in response to the killing of George Floyd and other instances of police violence throughout the state. Major cities like New York, Buenos Aires, London, these tend to be major hotspots for this art form, partly for the benefit of having a larger audience, but also as a way of relaying a city's collective consciousness and a way of examining the political mien that may not be reflected in the government representation. And so a good portion of my research into street art depictions of women in Northern Ireland has particularly been in the North being Derry and Belfast, the major population centers that we see there. And examining how these representations of women reiterate Ireland's history of descent from British colonial rule. And Derry 
maybe a relatively small city, but it has revealed itself within the last um, five to six decades as a notable hub of the Irish civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s and the art that came from that in the last few decades. And this has resulted in a very iconic collection of street art that has carried into the present. And so political street artists in Northern Ireland use the agency of their art form to spotlight, to question and to challenge the established historic record. And so in the case of Northern Ireland, much of the history was written and recognized by the British state, but that often greatly differs from the perspective of the Irish civil rights activists. Furthermore, the concept of a one-sided perspective to history is a recurrent theme that we see in feminist art history, as much of the traditional art history studies have been written by men and for men and about male art artists. And so tonight I'm excited to share my research of street art. I believe it provides a viable approach to analyzing women's upper, un, underrepresented contributions to history and that mural painting in Northern Ireland has the capacity to serve as a mode of reparation in the established historic record and to provide an opportunity to emphasize the visibility and representation of women in the country. And so I always think it's important to begin with a examination of street art versus graffiti, because many times I hear graffiti as a response to a conversation on street art. And so the definition that I also fall within is that street art necessitates public space. The public space is intrinsic to the creation of the work of street art. And so does street art belong in museums? Is it still street art if it is in a museum or in a gallery? That is a question that many, many historians and art historians have debated over. I myself don't even enjoy taking part in that debate anymore because it's a challenge. There is no solid definition like we have with sculpture or like we have with painting. And so when it comes to street art, I usually fall within the idea that the public space is the most important aspect. And many times that public space is the street. And so I love, this painting, the one that we've seen over and over again in our advertising here. It is a wonderful representation that is in Belfast done by the UVC Arts. And I love that it has the graffiti over the top and that it has the street art. And many would say that the graffiti takes away from it, but I think it builds a conversation. And I think that is what we'll see a lot of tonight conversation based on the street art, based on the theme, based on the artist, and the conversations that come up when we examine works just like this. And so in this circumstance, we can see the woman with Ireland over her. This piece is titled Airy, and we can see the graffiti that's over it. And so we can see the best of both worlds. We can see our street art and we can see our graffiti very clearly. Graffiti is often designed or defined as written words. And most of the time they will be quite simple, just like this. We'll see them left and right on dumpsters, in alleyways, on fence posts, all over the place. And so this is a great way to look at both the street art and the graffiti. And in Ireland, graffiti is very, very popular. It, is, it has been around since the 1960s at the very, very, uh, latest at least, and it is very visible way for which people can express how they feel. And I love looking at some of this graffiti and kind of discussing what does this mean about this area? And so we'll often see paramilitary um, representations in the graffiti. Here you can see the IRA, the UDA, the RUC, but you can also see which of those paramilitaries are not welcome in these neighborhoods. You can see RUC not welcome, army keep out and things just like this. And so it's one way for communities to define their safe zones, their safe zones away from uh, policing and things like that. And so graffiti is still very popular in Northern Ireland and throughout Ireland as well. The bottom two photos are, are the bottom photo and the IRA photo at the top I took just two years ago. So you can see it has continued on through the 1960s, 70s, and so on. 
And then we like to throw a wrench in everybody's day. We've seen uh, street art murals, we've seen graffiti. So what is this? It has written word, does that make it graffiti? It also has these beautiful forms and representation. Does that still make it street art? And so in circumstances like this, I like to call these text-based murals. And so you can see it's based off of text, but this is a mural. It has beautiful uh, Celtic knots in it. It has a wonderful representation of Airy, the Gaelic term for Ireland. And so this is something that I would consider street art. It's elevated. It has so much color and beauty to it. And so street art is hard to define, but in many ways uh, it tries to define itself. And so as we continue to look more and more at street art throughout Ireland, I'd like to just take a moment to define where we're talking about, because I will say Ireland over and over and over again. And many times I will be talking about Northern Ireland and I will be talking about the Republic of Ireland, which are two very unique spaces. Uh, Northern Ireland is still a part of the United Kingdom and has connections with the British crown, while the Republic of Ireland is an independent is an independent nation. And so there are um, 26 counties in the Republic of Ireland and there are six counties in Northern Ireland. And many times when we talk about this era of dissent, the 1960s to the 1990s, we have to discuss loyalists, Republicans and the religions that go into that. So loyalists are largely unionist Protestants that assert loyalty and a connection to the British establishment in Ireland. But not all loyalists are members of paramilitaries and not all Republicans either. Republicans are often connected to political members interested in Catholic equality. And we'll also see a lot of conversations about uh, the Catholic civil rights movement as we move on today. These are very, very soft definitions. They could be expanded upon considerably, but I do understand that you don't have the next five to seven hours to discuss this with me. So we will have these very simple definitions to keep in your mind as I use terms like loyalist, like Republican and paramilitary. Now, street art in the Republic of Ireland, in my opinion, is a little bit different than what you'll see in Northern Ireland. We have beautiful works of art that span all across Dublin and other major cities, but I find that they're considerably less politically motivated than what we see in Northern Ireland. Here we have lots of representations of people, we see geometric figures, all sorts of figural shapes, and none of these, I would say, are inherently political. Um, in particular, I love looking at this series of portraits. Most of them depict women, but they depict individual experiences of people throughout Dublin and looking at young people and their ways of expression and kind of how that connects to street art. And again, we're not seeing anything that's per particularly political. And I think that's a theme that we will see more and more uh, throughout time as Dublin and the Republic of Ireland is more connected to the artistic value of street art, while in Northern Ireland, the artistic value is important, but it's also about telling their story. And we also see non-political art in Northern Ireland as well. It's important to remember that there are artistic movements that are outside of the political sphere. And I particularly enjoyed photographing these types of street art. I was offered a wonderful grant by the Luann Dummer Center for Women to go and photograph women in the streets and talk about these depictions of women. But what I found in certain areas, in the alleyways, hidden around corners, is you'll find these artistic expressions that are not inherently political. I love the dolly and of course, we're always keeping Belfast weird. And so these are a wonderful look at things that are a little less on the political side. But as we continue going throughout, we'll see lots of representation of Irish culture and Irish media. And I am a massive fan of Dairy Girls, and I hope all of you are too, or at least take the time to watch a couple 
uh, videos. This is a massive mural uh, by UV Arts that depicts the Dairy Girls and it's a show on Netflix and it also takes part during the troubles from the 1960s to the 1990s. But again, we're seeing a major representation of women and women's stories. Even if this isn't inherently political, it still connects to the political past of Ireland. And so it is just a fabulous mural and larger than life. This gable house is over two stories. And so you can just imagine how massive it is to look up and see these young girls telling a story of young women during a tumultuous time. Now, people often ask me, how are these large murals made? If that is two stories tall, how do they get up there? And more frequently than not, you'll find that these artists will use scaffolding. And so they will utilize this scaffolding to get higher up onto their um, area, the space that they're using on the wall. And then they will also go down. Many artists will use spray paint, some of them will use lines, some of them will freehand it, but there are plenty of different approaches. I really enjoyed watching this artist put this up in Belfast on the piece walls, where the artist would utilize tape to keep everything nice and straight. Um, he would use scaffolding to get up there. He would use paint brushes and all sorts of different forms. I found most frequently in the United States, there is a movement towards using more spray paint, but you'll also see with a lot of these large murals that are very artistically motivated that they are also using things like paint brushes. And so it's not always the spray paint that we associate with street art. And you can see down in the left corner, all the different paint brushes, all the different paint bottles and sizes that he was utilizing to create this wonderful mural that we'll take a larger, we'll take a look at um, this and other larger pieces as well. Although I was interested to find out that the mural that is on the Celtic Junction Art Center is created by projecting onto the wall. And so that is one more way in which artists can do that. I've seen many artists freehand as well, and I have no idea how they do it, but I respect it nonetheless. Now, as we move on, major hubs and artists of political street art in Northern Ireland, we will see many of them based in Belfast, as we've seen previously, and we'll, we will see many of them based in Derry. And I love pulling up this Google map because we can still see how the uh, political change in Ireland continues, because on Google Maps, it is also listed as London Derry, which is an entire conversation about is it dairy or is it London dairy and who controls this area and the naming of it? And you can see the connection uh, with the British establishment there in renaming of this city with London in the front of it. Now in these major hubs, some of the major artists that we see are Marty Lyons, Danny Deveni, and the three Bogside artists, Tom Kelly, William Kelly, and Kevin Hassan. And I do recognize, yes, those are a lot of male names, but we will talk a little bit more about women. It's important to see how these historic artists began the trend to include women and how women today are now continuing that trend. And so moving on, we can go back to this mural and we can see Marty Lyons, who is one of the major artists. And we can also see Bill Rolston, and they are examining the peace wall in Belfast. Bill Rolston is one of the first and only historians in Belfast to discuss where do women fit and how many women are being presented on these walls. And so his research inspired mine and the discussion that goes into how are we seeing women? How are women seeing women represented? And how does that affect us in seeing ourselves represented publicly on walls and in public spaces? And so here you can see them on the peace wall and you can see the peace wall in the background. The Belfast Peace Wall are a series of paintings that discuss peace in Ireland, but also that discuss peace throughout the world. And it is a way that Irish artists and Irish citizens connect with the struggles of other nations that have fought for their civil rights. And I think it's important to add that this Peace Wall is painted on a wall that is designed to separate people from one another. 
the walls that you see in Belfast and throughout Northern Ireland are major separation barriers, many of them 20 plus feet tall. And these separation barriers are throughout Northern Ireland and they separate neighborhoods of predominantly Republican and Catholics from predominantly loyalists and Protestants. And so even the people in Ireland still to this day are separated and they are segregated based on their neighborhoods and based on their religion and based on their political views. But I find it very poignant and very interesting that artists are taking over these forms of separation to create connection, not just within their own community, but throughout the community of the world. And the majority of these walls, which we call peace walls, um, are located in Belfast, but there are more than 20 miles of walls that are utilized to separate uh, the people from within this country. And I think that it's a very interesting representation of how uh, separation has continued since the 1960s and even beforehand. And as we look at these pieces, you can see how uh, these Northern Irish artists are connecting with people and themes and resistance and social awareness all throughout the world. Um, this was only two years ago that I took these photos in 2020. And so we're seeing discussions on the Yemeni genocide, on the destruction between Saudi Arabia and the United States. We're talking about uh, child slavery, and we're also talking about oppression and how that affects people throughout the world. Moving on, we have other social justice issues that are in discussion, talking about things like climate change and how that affects the general public, talking about uh, Papua in Indonesia and discussing how other small nations are experiencing these forms of segregation and inequality. And what I also like to find is particularly beautiful is that in Northern Ireland, teachers are teaching through street art. You can see a, a student group of art projects on the top left that are students who have come and expressed peace and what it means to them. And so street art is not just a part of the culture in Northern Ireland, it's a part of the curriculum. And so there is a much closer connection to Northern Ireland and the concept of street art than what we may see her here or be familiar with in the United States. And I think that is an important distinction that we can make um, because often people have this concept that street art is illicit and that it is vandalism. While in Ireland, it is a form of expression and a very, very important form of public expression. And so moving on past the peace walls, one of the most famous works of street art and might I even say graffiti is the free dairy sign. And this dairy sign has been there since the 1960s and it has con continued on as a marker of a free space, a public space and a place where people can come to connect with their history and the heritage of Ireland. And what I find interesting is, although this work of art has been here since the 1960s, it has a continued conversation. People utilize this now to discuss current issues with <clears throat> social justice, and also discussing things like the uh, COVID pandemic and appreciation for doctors and for nurses. But also, you can see in the top right, when it comes to discussions of police brutality, you can see that they are connecting uh, with places like Palestine, with places in the United States, and having a broader discussion about um, police brutality and the connection that many of these nations have in resistance to that. And I included the image on the far left just because I like taking a moment to look at how they're constantly painting over it over and over again to start a new conversation, but with a historic imagery, which is the free dairy sign. And below that painting, you can see solidarity um, uh, with a murdered uh, transgender activist in Derry. And so they have many conversations that are happening on this one sign and this one work of street art. And today we call it street art. I would call it a text-based mur mural, of course, but this goes back all the way to the 1960s when Irish Catholics were 
experiencing police brutality quite frequently. And so they would define safe spaces for themselves. And one way that they would do that is through graffiti. And so this work has been here since 1969. Uh, the artist of it came out many, many years later to discuss why he put this up. And that's because Derry was a free space uh, for Catholics to come, to protest, to express themselves in a place where they could feel safe from the potential backlash of police brutality. And so this sign is in many historic photos uh, dating back many, many decades. And it's always interesting to see how the conversation changes through this one sign. And so the image on the right says, you are now entering free dairy, but they added the carefree on there. And it's interesting to see carefree while they have many police members in this riot gear, very prepared um, to infiltrate the neighborhood. And so as we continue on, we've seen many instances of the dairy sign internationally, and it's now become an international sign and connection of free spaces for public protest. And I love seeing these all throughout the world. Uh, up on the top left, you can see you are now entering free Deshay, uh, which this was sent to me by a historian who studies military street art. And he heard of me and he sent it over to me. Erica Lior over in Spain and even here in Seattle, where they were protesting after the murder of George Floyd and against police brutality. And so we see other nations, other people taking inspiration from Irish street art um, to create these spaces. And I think that shows the significance of Irish street art in protest art, but also um, in the world's art as well. And so this is an exquisite example of how Ireland has expanded. Now, major themes in this political street art are, of course, the paramilitaries, the Irish Republican Army, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, but also historic events, looking at memorials and memorializing those whose lives were lost during these protests, um, the hunger strike of the 1970s and 80s, um, women, and we'll discuss that more at the end, as well as discussions of peace and kind of what that looked like in Ireland. And so when we begin looking at these, we have to discuss these paramilitary uh, murals and looking at, is this a discussion of pride? Are we proud of our roots and of our heritage? Or is this propaganda to try to get young men and women into these armies by propagating the idea of uh, pride and fighting back. And so many, many council members throughout cities in Northern Ireland, uh, parliament members have had discussions of when is it appropriate to take down these pieces? When did they push the side of propaganda as opposed to pushing the side of pride? And so in many areas like Belfast, they have offered different grants to have these types of murals covered. And so they are less common today than they were in the 70s and 80s, but we do still see them throughout Northern Ireland still to this day. And so it is a vast discussion still about in their um, political side. And what I think is one of the most poignant pieces that I found in Northern Ireland are historic events when we discuss events that kind of change the path in Northern Ireland um, and in the civil rights movement. And this photograph is one of the most popular, I think you'll find in every single history book regarding the troubles in Northern Ireland. And so it's poignant and it's profound and it is in the People's Gallery in Northern Ireland, right behind the dairy, free dairy sign. And so you see a young man in a gas mask, and these gas masks are also associated with warfare. And children often evoke this idea of childhood innocence. And so when we combine these two, it brings to mind this loss of innocence as a result of war. And this mural is massive. It's so large that it covers the entire side of a gable house. And the boy holds a larger than life petrol bomb made from a milk bottle. It's unlit, but clearly it is prepared for some purpose. And so 
This 1994 mural titled The Petrol Bomber recreates the 1969 photograph by Clive Link Limpkin that was taken during the three day Battle of the Bogside riot. It is one of the many works of street art located in the Free Dairy Corner, and it tells the story of communal resistance during an era of extreme and immense violence and repeated instances of collective trauma. And so this is one instance of a major historic event and telling the story from the perspectives of the underrepresented. Many of those are children. And so when you discuss things like the Battle of the Bogside, it was a large three-day riot that took place um, in August of 1969, and thousands of Catholic, Irish, nationalists, um, and residents of the Bogside area in Derry organized together to form a pre peaceful protest that turned into a riot over time. And they worked with the Derry Citizens Defense Association, as well as other civil rights associations um, to kind of bring this protest that we will see um, once more when we discuss the conversation of Bernadette Devlin. And I have her here. She was a member of the Civil Rights Association. And I find it interesting that she is the person who they utilize to represent the Battle of the Bogside, a woman as a representation of a major uh, moment in Northern Irish history and in dairy history. And we'll discuss her a little bit more as we go on. The second historic event that we'll see quite frequently is Bloody Sunday, which happened on January 30th, 1972. Um, at this time, there was a public demonstration um, now known as the Bogside Massacre. Um, on that day, 10 to 15,000 men, women, and children assembled in Derry to participate in a march to protest the enactment of internment without trial. Um, multiple film crews were there, news, everything was there to really highly document this event, which is why we see these fabulous representations of real life moments depicted in these works of art. And so it shows the aftermath, essentially, of British troops that opened fire into gathered crowds. Um, it was established that there is an exact exact certainty why this happened, but the result was 13 civilians dying instantly, another dying later, and 28 wounded men and women, and unfortunately, many of those civilians were children under the age of 18, and so this is a major moment of collective trauma, of pain, and of community uh, pain, and so seeing it portrayed in these murals, Larger Than Life, really tries to connect with major moments. And one of the most major ones are the um, carrying of the bodies and the young men and women who were carried away. And you can see this here with the priest, Father Daly, uh, holding a white handkerchief and waving it over his head and telling everybody, please don't shoot. We're just trying to get this man off of the street. And so these murals really connect with these moments of intense pain. And so memorials in particular are one way in, in which people and artists in Northern Ireland have expressed themselves publicly. And so from Bloody Sunday, the Bloody Sunday commemoration was the fourth mural that was erected in the People's Gatter Gallery in 1999, which was the 27th anniversary of the massacre. In it are the faces of the 14 people who lost their lives. And so using portraits to memorialize and humanize these victims is very important, especially when it comes to sectarian violence, where many of these people are utilizing this street art in the process of communal healing and to combat the criminalization of protesters who may have been killed. Now, protests continued on beyond the streets. Many of those who were arrested during protests or who were arrested as members of paramilitary and so on, uh, continued to protest when they were in prison. And so one of the most popular forms of muralism in Ireland are depictions of hunger strikers, 
and depictions of hunger strike memorials. And so prison protests, blanket protests, hunger strikes, these were all utilized in the prisons throughout Northern Ireland. And so many times when these uh, requests were not met, um, hunger strikes would begin. And so one of the major hunger strikes began in October of 1980. And this ended in the death of eight prisoners during the 1981 hunger strike, including a member of parliament known as Bobby Sands. And this began, in my opinion, the first major movement of muralism in Northern Ireland. The remembrance of these individuals through memorialization and the remembrance of what they did as hunger strikers. And so you'll see many representations beginning in the 1970s of hunger strike and memorializations. And so this is evidenced by the considerable increase in imagery and slogans all throughout Northern Ireland. And one that you will see quite frequently are the representations of Bobby Sands. He was a member of parliament at the time, one of the youngest in his early 20s, um, and he was one of the first to pass away. And so these representations of Bobby can be seen all throughout. He is a major figure. And one of the most famous murals are, of course, these two by Danny Deveni, which is the beautiful very vibrant coloration that you can see on the memorial of Bobby Sands on the left and on the memorial that you see on the right, which is the 30 year anniversary. But I recognize I've spent a lot of this time talking about men and the major theme that I want to discuss today is looking at women and kind of where do they fit in the act of resistance. And so we're seeing more and more representations of women popping up today. And what I find particularly interesting <clears throat> on the discussion of where do women fit into this, during the height of the Irish civil rights movement from 1968 to 1998, we see separate yet synchronous developments in both female activism, especially throughout the 1980s and its connection to street art. Um, it has only been in the modern era that we have begun to see women portrayed with more and more frequency. And a study by Dr. Bill Rolston in 2018 analyzed over 2.3 thousand murals in Northern Ireland. And he reported during this time that only 13.5% of murals contained female depictions. And it should be noted that 21% of political murals from Republican perspectives feature representations of, of women. And so in this, there are only 0.5% of depictions of women in loyalist murals. And so kind of what is this difference? Why are we seeing less women in loyalist murals? And why are we seeing more women in Republican murals? And I believe this is in part due to the activism of women during the civil rights movement in Ireland. And so when we see more women in these Republican murals, we've begun to discover more and more underrepresented figures and voices of women during this time period when many men were featured and put more into the spotlight and in the news and in the history books. And so I believe street art is one way in which we are reprimanding and making up for those times in which women were not giving the representation in which we need. And so here you can see a very large mural that is put up in Derry that looks at women's and women's struggle dating all the way back to the mid 19th century and all the way to 2015 and highlighting some women and members of uh, women's groups throughout Northern Ireland. And so to delve a little bit more in here, um, I discussed earlier Bernadette Devlin Michalski, and I think it's important to discuss why is she the individual in which is on the face of the Battle of the Bog side. And I think this mural is an excellent way to kind of delve into her history. And so the mural was installed in 1996 and it depicts Bernadette Devlin McCallisky. 
is her full name now. And she's speaking through a megaphone at the Battle of the Bogside. Her left hand is very assertively reaching out and it's a gesture of dialogue in a time where violence was mainly the answer. And so you can see a woman in the background who is kneeling in the streets and she has a metal trash can in her hand. And I think that is an interesting detail to consider because women many times were homemakers and they were housewives and they were staying home with their children. And so one way small but extremely significant way that women would contribute is that when police were coming into town, when they would see uh, police members or members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary or the army coming into their neighborhood, women would leave their houses, they would grab the lids and the of their trash cans and they would start banging them in the streets. And this would let everybody know, go back inside, it is not safe outside right now, or it would let members of the Irish Republican Army or other paramilitary groups know it's time to hide and get out of the way. And so this is one way in which women would utilize what they had to contribute, even if they were not able to publicly be outside protesting. And so on there, you can also see in the background a young boy who's using a metal shield uh, or a bin that's supposed to look like a metal shield. And he has a stick in his hand that looks like a sword. And I really do love that representation. I think it's comparable to representations of ancient Irish warriors and strong individuals. And this boy is recreating that in his own way. And you can see the two young men in the background as well. In an interview with the Bogside artists, they discussed the significance of putting Bernadette Devlin Mikowski here. Um, and their mindset behind this in the design of the mural was to portray the role of women during the troubles and their place in the front line of negotiating peace. This work was inspired by Devlin's speech that was captured by many camera crews. Look it up on YouTube. It is a very, very passionate speech. Um, and after the speech, she was arrested and put into prison for inciting a riot. And so you can see ways in which they are trying to kind of silence these women's voices. And at the time, Bernadette was one of the leaders of the Civil Rights Association, and she was the youngest member of parliament ever elected at the age of 21. And it's interesting to see how um, such a young woman is already a member of parliament because she is putting herself there in that front line and negotiating peace. And in that same interview, the Bogside artist who created this had a major discussion on what women did that may not have been protesting, but that was a major way of contributing to the civil rights movement. Many of these women were out there and they were working, they were working in the shirt factories and bringing home money because many of them had husbands who were in the militaries, in the paramilitaries, and so they were the sole breadwinners for their families. And we'll discuss a little bit more at the end about different ways in which women contributed, even, the, even if they were not able to directly be in the front line. Now, one of my all time favorite murals is the Manana Erin which is Gaelic for Women of Ireland. This is created by Marty Lyons, who we saw earlier, and Danny Deveni. And so this piece was completed in 2014, and it is massive. It is in the Garton Square of Derry, Northern Ireland, and it is so intricate, and it's such a large work. It spans almost two whole city blocks, and there's so much detail in it. But what I find particularly significant, it is also one of the only and very few murals in the North that addresses the stories of women exclusively and women who contributed to Irish Republican movements in many different ways other than protesting. And so when we take a little bit of a closer look at this, in the top left, you can see women who are taking place in a blanket protest. Uh, just like we had seen earlier um, with men of the hunger strike. Uh, women were also major protesters throughout uh, the prison system and in person. And so in this time, they are doing a blanket strike. 
And so many times the prisoners of the civil rights movement would refuse to wear the outfits of uh, common criminals. They would say that they are political prisoners that are, that are protesting for political purposes. And so they do not deserve to be wearing prisoners outfits. And so they would go naked for multiple weeks and only wear their blankets in protest of being uh, visibly represented as a criminal. And so you can see that in the top left. And on the bottom, you can also see uh, the entirety of the mural. But let's look a little bit closer into this mural because there are many segments that we can see throughout it that are um, pulling out different stories of different women. And on here on the bottom left, you can see the Countess Markiewicz. Um, she's one of the most recognizable female volunteer soldiers for the Irish cause and for the Republican organization known as the Cuman Amon. The Cuman Amon are instantly recognizable to most Irish citizens because they have a widely known place in Irish history after they were established as early as 1914 during the Irish Revolutionary Period. They impacted the Irish Revolution through public demonstration, medical care, they assisted military endeavors, and they also took place in open warfare and spying. And what I found particularly interesting is that they also were major weapon smugglers. And that is because they had the capacity to smuggle guns in their dress for the war effort. Um, Underneath the dress of an Irish woman was a place that many British soldiers did not dare to go. And so it was a safe place for women to be able to hide guns and bring them for the resistance movement. And so to the left of the center, um, you can see Countess Markovitz, who is holding up the flag and she has this kind of centralized position within the composition, and it really denotes her significance and her importance, because beyond their ongoing push for national independence, it was one of the first organizations in Ireland to, to really discuss where does gender equality fit? If we have a united Ireland, if we have a Republic of Ireland, what equality will women see from that? And so by putting themselves on the forefront, they were also putting uh, women's rights on the forefront as well. But it is always important to consider that not all women of the Cuman Amman were serving in uniforms and in ranks. They served in many ways and contributed in many ways um, from 1914 and they are still around today. And so they haven't always been political, but they've been a major organization in the history of Ireland and in Northern Ireland. Now, as we've continued to discuss more and more about women's experiences beyond working in the forefront, it's also important to discuss women's experiences um, throughout this time and how their relationship with political prisoners kind of changed uh, their connection. And so here was once a hunger strike image. It showed a man in a blanket having a hunger strike. His name was Raymond McCarthy. And that was a very important moment. But for the first time, somebody considered what was it like for the wife, for the mother, for the daughter, for the sister of that hunger striker? And what was their experience? because the pain of losing a loved one in prison expands to all the people around them. And so this work was completed in 2016. So it's a relatively uh, new piece. Um, and it utilizes a female blanket protester in the back. And it also has the depiction of the mother and the sister of the blanket protester, Patsy O'Hara. And so you can see him in the lower left corner. And it really kind of highlights the loss experienced by the female loved ones of those who died during the hunger strikes. And women at that point would often become the sole monetary and psychological support for their family. And so it is very interesting to note that this is the second mural in which the Bogside artists 
are highlighting the experience of women, not just women on the forefront, but women in general in Northern Ireland that are recovering from the collective trauma and actively experiencing the collective trauma of the war and the resistance in Northern Ireland. And one thing that I find particularly important when it comes to women's role in the family is how women connect Celtic culture to their families. And so one of the last themes we'll discuss today is just how important Celtic culture has become in the street art movement of today. And so women take on many roles in Irish mural imagery. And you can see here, it's interesting that in a lot of this Celtic mural imagery, there's almost always a woman in it. And you can see on the top and on the bottom left images, there are also representations of the Gaelic language and of the Celtic language in Ireland. And so you can see Celtic on the top and you can see the traditional name of Derry um, spelled in the Gaelic uh, spelling. And so women take on all these roles in this Irish mural imagery. And these roles differ from one to the next, but the central theme that we're seeing is that women have an extremely unique place in representing the struggles and the strengths in cultural identity. It is significant to reflect on where women fit into the process of cultural continuance, because many Irish mothers and women over the past two centuries have assumed the role of cultural conduit to their families and to their children. And so while raising children, women will pass down this language and this history through stories. And so the concept of Ireland is often related to the concept of Mother Ireland. And this is really a reiteration of the role that mothers undertake in this continuation of cultural practices. And so you can see here um, that women are consistently related to uh, the culture and the Celtic identity that you see throughout Ireland. And one of my all time favorite artists is an artist named Frizz. Um, you can check out her website. She has wonderful representations of women, of Celtic goddesses and different figures in Celtic mythology. And it's interesting to see how she utilizes her artwork um, to just have a discussion about the place of women. And so the Celtic mythology of Ireland, which I'm hoping Carrie will discuss with us afterwards, uh, provides multitude of public, powerful female figures throughout Ireland's history. And goddesses are featured in Northern Ireland Republican wall murals, in addition to many female Catholic saints and icons, like the Virgin Mary is very popular as well. And there has been a definite and distinct revival of Celtic heritage throughout the latter 20th century in Ireland. Um, this can be considered a reprisal for the many decades in which British authorities prohibited the use of the traditional language, traditional Gaelic games, and even the practice of Catholicism at some points. And so the goddess figures provide a pictorial representation of matronly wisdom of culture of connection to the next generation and this imagery has been utilized as a visually ap appeasing personification of traditional irish heritage and so the mythological kind of goddess archetype is very significant within the context of the ongoing push for the revitalization of irish culture and so the nation itself we will see very often in many of these murals is personified as a goddess-like figure referred to as Mother Ireland in stories and in visible visual depictions. And so it's very interesting to see how representations of women have increased, particularly when it comes to connecting with the Irish culture. Now, the last thing that I would like to discuss today, and hopefully my headset won't go out yet again, is the collective of women still to this day who are creating street art to heighten the 
visual representation of women, but also to heighten the safe spaces for women to create art in the public and in streets. And so the Mana Collective is a collected a collective of 12 different female artists who are phenomenal representations of who have phenomenal representations of street art all throughout Northern Ireland, Belfast, Dublin, and so on. And so Frizz is on this, as we've just seen some of her work, but so are several of our artists who focus on creating more representations of women, but also furthering the political discussion of women, their place within Ireland, and their place within the constant movement for civil rights and equality throughout the North. And so I'm going to leave us at this, and I implore you all, please take a moment, check out the Mana Collective, support some of these artists, and take the time to maybe buy some of their things and represent it in your home or in your life to kind of further the cause of women in street art, but especially close to all of us, Irish women and their work in street art. Thank you. Right, lovely. And with that, Molly, we're going to try to um, welcome and bring back our panelists. And uh, they are Carrie Finnegan and Janine Malik, if you guys want to jump in and join us. Uh, they are actually very special panelists for us here at the Celtic Junction Art Center. Um, now, while we have uh, a wealth of people, of course, who are from Ireland who were involved in the troubles, um, who know some of the people who we're talking about. Um, Carrie and Janine are, are here really to speak with us about really bringing this home into what does it mean to be a woman artist. And I, what I'm interested in, if you guys want to uh, go ahead and and just reflect on the panel uh, or reflect on the the presentation that Molly gave us, uh, and particularly as it as it interests you in your particular art. Um, would one of you like to go first, Carrie or Janine? Janine, sure. Yeah, I'd love to to take that. Um, one of the things I noticed a lot was the symbolism that it, it recurs between imagery, um, the oak leaf in particular representing in the Ohm uh, Irish alphabet, the concept of strength often and um, not work also around the perimeter um, is often used for protection, like kind of a border of not work to hold the rest of the image together, but also to protect and um, create a, a bubble kind of of safety. And um, a lot of the imagery had Im images that derived from conflict, but um, that conflict is then what created the safe space that, um, you know, it is an act of placemaking to make a mural and that energy um, that's poured into that imagery then becomes kind of an anchor for everything that comes after in that space. Um, in particular, in regards to street arts here in Minneapolis, I lived very close to George Floyd Square when that event occurred. And I noted um, immediately um, when there was heightened energy and a lot of kind of chaotic, um, you know, all sorts of different feels coming out for everyone. The moment that a mural went up on that intersection was the moment that all of that energy congealed and coalesced into the memorial that it is now. And we saw that kind of spoke out away from that space all down Lake Street, you know, as that uh, corridor has been rebuilt. And um, I really credit those mural artists for securing the safety of that zone and bubble um, for the residents and the community. Thank you so much, Janine. Okay. So a, a couple things actually made, um, picked my interest that Molly talked about. Um, so women in art is, is a hard one. So we in the United States, I'm American, like to put our own lens on what we're seeing. And somebody pointed out to me once that we have a unique ability to really be able to speak out against our situations, our government, our economics, our relationships, whatever it might be, fairly freely and without uh, a risk of, of death or harm or imprisonment. 
in the United States. There are other countries where us just having a conversation like this could lead to going to prison. So part of it is that in Ireland, especially going back a bit, women in particular had much less um, ability to be able to express themselves in a public manner that didn't risk things tremendously. Another thing that was really different, and you start seeing the increase of women as artists and women as social justice speakers, is that uh, family planning started. It is really hard to be politically active and to be a rabble rouser and to say your piece when you're worried about your security, number one, but when you marry and start having babies really quickly, your life is very different and it's differently oppressed than men are. So, you know, the fact that you start seeing the societal kind of mirror going on is fantastic. And uh, I'm sure there'll be more questions we can get into the, to some of the mythology questions a little bit later, but I kind of went the social opportunity with women not, not really being allowed to have a voice. And so murals finally, when you have a, a little bit of time with less children or, or more trust from your community, start being able to be more public about their voice versus the, the privateness that was going on. Hence the, you know, sneaking ammunition under your dresses because nobody's gonna mess with you. Um, so we've always played a role, but it used to be a lot less in the public eye, so to say. Molly, do you wanna to respond to either one of those? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is so significant to discuss the different role that women were expected to have and what they decided to take. And so in these heavily uh, Christian nations, still to this day, Catholicism is very heavy in Northern Ireland and throughout Ireland. Women are expected to have children very young and to marry very young. And so the fact that these women who have to watch their children and have to take the time to uh, care for their family, especially because unemployment for Catholic men was extremely high. I mean, frequently throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, above 20%. And so those men were out protesting and things like that. And so the women had to take care of their families. And yet there's still time finding ways to find um, and to connect and express themselves. And so doing things like the trash can lids, doing things like the blanket protests, um, I think it's a way where women could um, do what we would consider small things, but any way to connect with the movement, even if they're at home, even if they have children, they found a way. And I think that is particularly significant when we have discussions that the small things add up. Well, I think uh, one of the parts that I'd like to maybe guide the discussion is the idea that street art is uh, one of the most democratic forms. Of course, it's open to all, it's out in the public. And once that happens, you're removing certain barriers, you're removing certain expectations and possibly even certain stereotypes. And so everything becomes outside rather than internal. I think a lot of women's work has been internal in many ways, either, you know, raising the families or creation or inside homes. And then for it to go outside really captures a new part of the zeitgeist that was emerging through the 60s and 70s, which was really exciting um, to see. Uh, what are your favorite parts about that, Molly? Um, when it comes to street art, the major studies are always into the political side of street art. And I believe in Ireland, it was just, like you said, the perfect storm where people needed a way to express themselves because they weren't given the representation that they needed in the news as a result of British control. Um, and it was a way where they could communicate with one another. And so I think it's so significant when we, add, when we discuss street art as a public space. Um, it is one of the few types of art where there are no barriers. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to crawl over a fence. I've done that once or twice, gone into a creepy alley. But at the end of the day, it is by the public for the public. And so it is one of the most efficient ways to have these discussions about dissent and resistance. And so Ireland, I believe, was the absolute perfect storm to create street art as a cultural form as a cultural art form 
there because these people needed to express themselves and they needed to do it together publicly. And so I agree fully. Here you Go yeah, I want, I want to jump in. So, so a lot of people don't know, but but way back in the day, so not super far back, but in the 1800s, there used to be predominantly rich white men in Europe that would buy the most beautiful Botticelli or whatnot. They'd put it in their mail, their man study. It would be above the fireplace. It'd be in a closed cabinet. And after they were served their dinner and they were retired to the study to have their cigars and their cognac. Of course, only men were allowed into the study. They would view this beautiful art, this, this, this art. And that is the exact epitome opposite of what street art is. And Natalie, I think you said it best. This is, this is art as democracy. This is art as full inclusion. Whether you agree with it or not, it is there for people to look at it through their own eyes, with their own interpretation, and read in and continue to pass along that story. It's visual storytelling being broadcast by, you know, a speaker to your eyes. And it's really, really wonderful to see it's the, you know, opposite of art hoarding, essentially. So um, it speaks louder. It's not easily uh, commodifiable either in that format. Like it, it's, it really is a contemporary folk art because like you said, Molly, you know, of the people for the people. But um, I mean, you could snap a picture and put it on a thing, but it's not about an object. It's about an experience and a placemaking and an act of placemaking in community, I think, which is important to that medium and about relationships, like so much reflection of relationships um, between people and um, building community, community building and kind of projecting that energy outward. I love what you saying, Janine, about the place making the community. Uh, what were you gonna say there? I'm sorry, I was gonna say, you can see how it resonates with people globally though. I mean, with Molly's examples of you are entering free dairy being adopted in so many different locations, because regardless of our language, we've learned to understand it of this is a place where, where you, the people, can speak and be safe doing so. You are welcome here. And just seeing how that's broadcasted and continues to this day shows you how powerful this type of community message is. And one thing that I would also like to add is community message, extremely important, and also community healing. You know, street art, when we see these memorializations, perfect example, the George Floyd Memorial. So many people come here uh, and come to Minneapolis, to Minnesota from all over the world. I've met people there um, to memorialize this man and memorialize uh the lives that have been lost. And it's very similar in Northern Ireland. And so I see memorialization and building community through that, uh, an international community is one way in which people heal and heal from collective trauma uh, more than anything. There were many people who experienced trauma as a result of the troubles and the lives that were lost as a result of the murder of George Floyd. And so it's amazing to see these connections all over the world in our own hometown and over in um, in Ireland to see how people are not only using street art to send a message, but using street art to heal and heal with others. That's so important and such an exciting part of where we're at in the world right now. Um, and I think part of it is, is art. The reason I, maybe all of us have gone into it is because it represents something more than just ourselves. Uh, it really can be the zeitgeist of the moment. Um, you know, in, in these different cases, it's represented revolution, um, subversion, questioning, uh, systems of power, uh, maybe attempting to transform things. So what it's doing is transforming by and large with a positive energy um, into that community space, into it is into a cityscape, like you were saying, Janine. I love that idea of uh, public art as a communal experience so that there's something shared. And it's really interesting, Molly, that you're talking about that idea of collective healing, especially as now really within the last, um, I suppose even five years that there's been a huge explosion of not just women represented 
in public street art, but women actually doing the street art. That last slide was my favorite part. You know, we could spend an entire um, seminar really just talking about those women and what they're doing. And I'm interested in you guys, uh, you know, how do you feel that when, when women come together in a collective as a solidarity, how does the conversation change? I think healing collective trauma, Molly's already touched on one of them. Um, you know, whether it's specific women's rights, how does that solidarity change the bigger picture of what public art means right now and possibly going forward? I think there is a little difference in the way that women organize themselves and the, the collective in particular with shared leadership. You know, um, there was been a lot of um, a lot of respect uh, given to Black Lives Matter as a movement and all of the women leadership and the decentralized leadership within that and um, where like historically with you know nation states and all of the kinds of politics that um, have been at play there's a leader there's a hierarchy there's a you know kind of power grabbing instead of power sharing and that power hoarding kind of being a little different from the way I think that women tend to operate in a communal setting. Um, that seems important to me. Um, one other thing, sorry not to get off topic, Natalie, but um, the way that these pieces exist in the environment and are subject to the elements and decay and um, Molly, your appreciation of the layers of um, graffiti over the top of the murals, I think is important too. And that dialogue, it's not a static object, it's a living thing. Um, I think that that's really um, important about these pieces as well. I would agree with Janine that when, when not all, I mean, we are generalizing here, but when women come together, there's more of an aspect of how can I help? How can I contribute? without being told kind of what to do. So when we come together, it seems that uh, we're a lot more open to asking questions and exploring new things and really um, being more emotionally available, I guess. And I see that kind of more egalitarian kind of hierarchy that comes out of women's movements tends to create some more vibrant art because you're open to considering things that you just naturally aren't thinking of because I see people truly listen to each other differently when you get a group of women together. And this is all women. As soon as you throw a male into it, the dynamics are completely off again. So if you put like a bunch of women in a room and it's only women, it is so weird. Like pay attention after Thanksgiving, generally speaking, again, I'm generalizing, right? But women will get up and start doing things without being asked to be helpful, to contribute. While um, generally speaking, men will wait or they'll ask if they can help. So there's a very different approach to how things get done um, if you watch the different groups of people. And that, you know, there's outliers and it changes and everybody's got their personality, but that's a big thing that I see when I watch different groups of people, just how differently it organizes and moves. What I also I, think about these collectives is it's important to know that women create safe spaces for other women. And historically, uh, research has been done about female street artists and women who have done street art, you know, let's say in New York City in the 1980s in the subway, it wasn't always a safe space to do that. You're going out at night because it is illicit and many times it is vandalism, but you're going out at night, uh, you're often going alone, there aren't always graffiti crews that are open to having women. And so it is generally less safe. And so historically, we've seen women more doing street art, um, and doing it uh, on a basis of being hired by different companies and organizations to create murals. And so when you have a collective like this, when you have an all female graffiti crew, uh, women have the opportunity to protect each other, to create safe spaces. Um, and I think that's very important when we discuss women collectives and why it's even necessary to have collectives like this um, to create these spaces where we can feel comfortable and where we can feel heard. 
I think that piece about being heard is important. Yeah, I, I definitely resonate with that. Mm -hmm. um, We're all nodding our heads. Janine, go ahead, finish with your, with your thought. Um, it just escaped me. So I'm going to wait a second and see if it comes back. I wanted to mention the cow, and, and so I'm going to throw in a little mythology here because the cow is just really beautiful. Um, so way back, old, so mythology is about answering the big questions, the big whys. You know, why does the why does the sun eclipse? Why does the ground shake? Why do our crops fail? How, why do we get here? What happens if you die? Blah 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 blah. And it was an oral tradition. So I mean, the majority of humans, we didn't have written language until the last 25% of our existence. So it's all culture is really normal. It's an oral tradition in a lot of very repressed um, cultures where their, their, their sense of self, their sense of background their, their is being trying to be driven out of them. It tends to rebound and become really important again. So there's a huge resurgence in like the Irish language and you know the central mythology themes, but the cow was actually sacred. It was it was like you know this big deal. Having a cow is a tie to a lot of goddesses, and it probably probably if you want to break it down, symbolized the fact that if you were fortunate enough and wealthy enough to have a cow you would probably live through the winter. So having a cow is like this amazing thing because not many people had them. So the practicality of some of our, our goddess accoutrement, right? Oh, Molly, I, Carrie, I feel like we could get, now we could have an entire seminar just on the mythology. Of the cow. <laughs> um, the mythology of the cow, mythology of the river goddess, of the goddesses full stop. We could go into the details of the oak trees and you guys are just, you know, the two perfect to have that conversation with, but we're running out of time a little bit here. So I'm going to move on to some question and answer. And let's see then um, if you, if you have something else you want to kind of add in at the end, uh, we'll bring our audience in to uh, participate in the conversation. My first question here is from uh, P. O'Neill. Um, they say wonderful presentation. I'd like to know how to follow the artist Fritz that was mentioned. Thank you, Molly. Could you feel that one? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go on to the Mina Collective website, which I just believe is minacollective.com. And that is spelled M-I-N-A-W. And that will connect you to all of their websites and all of their Instagrams. I highly recommend following all of them on Instagram to see what new art they have. But I have purchased stuff from Frizz so many times that I know her website off the top of my head. And that is this is frizz.com. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And for everybody else, I think what we could do is, Molly, maybe you could type that in for everyone as a resource. And then what I'll do at the end, which I like to do for our seminars, um, when we put it up as a recording, we'll also include some of the um, resources. I think there's a few other ones, maybe that Carrie and Janine, if you'd like to contribute anything, reading resources, other resources they might find on the internet, we'll do some of that as well. Um, we have a, it looks like more of a comment um, from Andrew Valencia. Um, they say the role of women during wartime Europe, for instance, can occasionally be seen as quote, collaborative, end quote, sometimes even collaborative with entities who are considered quote, the enemy, end quote. Is there ever this sort of critique of women Presented in Northern Irish street art, critique of women who may be considered collaborators, I mean. Molly, do you have any response to that? Yeah, I would say that when it comes to female collaborators uh, in Northern Ireland between, uh, I would say, the Irish public and, you know, maybe the British Parliament, is that there are many different parties you know it's not the two-party system that we see frequently here there's multiple parties in um european politics and so women are extremely um <clears throat> are extremely active in many facets of politics and many fac facets of the um political parties that we see throughout northern ireland and throughout europe and so i would say you know those type of collaborations are women who are working in politics and who are creating policy for Northern Ireland um, on the in the British Parliament. 
All right, uh, I have another question here from Lori Maloney, and they say, I am curious about the substance and quality of the Northern Ireland street art in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. I've seen a couple around, hmm, I've spent most of my time in the rural areas of the Republic of Ireland. So I was about to say around the Kilkenny area, I've seen quite a few, and around in some of the rural areas um, outside of Derry, when you kind of get on the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But as you'll find, if you explore Ireland a little bit more, uh, once you hit those rural areas, it's vast fields. They don't have uh, lots of trees and forests like we see here in Minnesota. So there's actually less areas to put that, but I've actually seen what I may consider graffiti um, on like abandoned cars and on the many different walls. And if you've been to Ireland, you know that there are lots of walls everywhere. Um, I've seen some on walls, but I would say it is much less common in rural areas, but um, maybe they're just hidden on some of those back roads that frankly, I'm too scared to drive on because they're too small. All right. And uh, if there's any other questions, I think we just have a couple minutes left. Um, I'll watch for any other things that, um, but I think we'd like to leave with our panelists just as we contemplate um, this idea of the collective of women and of solidarity in art and the direction that it is going to take. Um, Molly's already intimated the idea of, of collective healing, of, of bringing people together into that public space. Um, do you have any other, any other things you'd like to contribute to that, that idea of collective healing, collective uh, addressing collective trauma or, or the direction that you feel that work like this is going to take in the future? Well, Natalie, I have actually written a 40 page paper about it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to take that out right now and I'm going to read it word for word. Um, so I hope we have another hour. But in summary, you know, I think many people experience collective trauma, whether it's a video that we see online of a man having a having police brutality, um, whether it is uh, a bombing in a city collective trauma is something that we experience together. And it's also something that we can heal together. Uh, but there aren't always opportunities for mental health. And we found statistically that people in Northern Ireland suffer from mental health issues uh, considerably higher than many of the surrounding areas. And many uh, psychologists believe that that's in connection to the troubles and what they experience. And so when we think of instances like collective trauma, um, it's important to think about collective healing. And there's many ways to do that. But I feel like in our own community and in Northern Ireland, we found that public gathering, public rem remembrance, uh, public memorialization is very important. It's very different than when you go home and you pray or you go home and you consider these things. But when you can see something, when you can visualize it, when you can connect with it um, on a on a level that's just beyond your thoughts, it's very significant. And if you can see the person next to you doing that as well, it's even more significant. And so when we continue to examine street art, and I hope that this will continue in the future, and honestly, I should probably just apply for a doctorate. We should continue to see these studies and these research into how collective art uh, can help people come together and heal from traumas. And so, I definitely tell everybody, I do the street art walking tours here in Minneapolis. I tell everybody at the end of the day, when you see this graffiti and when you see the street art, take a moment to consider what is the message and how can I connect with this? And why is this in my community? And why is my community supposed to connect with this? And take a moment to consider, you know, how art and how public art connects us with one another. I think that's a beautiful moment to end on and our time has come to an end. If there's any other questions, I'll forward them to Molly. Perhaps she'll be able to answer them uh, via email or uh, another way. Meanwhile, you can find Molly at the Adina Historical Society and you can find Carrie and Janine working here in the Twin Cities as artists and also as educators. Um, 
what I wanted to say earlier, and I kind of skipped over it, is that they are two of the instructors for the Celtic Junction Arts Center. Um, they're part of our creative arts and wellness department, and we've been just delighted to have all three of you here tonight. Bless you and thank you. If you guys want to hang on for a minute, we'll say goodbye to our audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Please um, consider visiting again for another Celtic Junction Arts Center seminar. Take care, everybody.